We've got a lot to talk about ahead of that decision. So joining us now to discuss is Sterling Professor of Economics at Yale University and author of the new book, Narrative Economics, Bob Schiller. Bob, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Um, there's a lot to, to get to you in the book, but first just want to ask you about your expectations of what the Fed is prepared to announce at 2 p.m. and then when we hear Che Powell uh, step yeah. to the podium at 2.30. Well, I, like others, think they will probably cut by a quarter basis point and there will be some dissent. Mm -hmm. It's not a clear case. I think they uh, worry about, well, last time in July when they started cutting, they were worried about not doing anything and we might end up with, they could be really criticized if they didn't do anything. Uh -huh. uh, so they've set, they've set a motion downward. Will they continue it or not? It's not that momentous uh, news item, I have to say. <laughs> You're not intrigued by the decision itself. I, I think I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't disagree. Uh, certainly far be it for me to disagree with the Nobel Prize winning economist. <laughs> but I do want to talk about some of the underlying data, right? Obviously housing, uh, a big right. area that you love to focus on. U.S. home construction surged to more than a 12-year high in August. Housing starts rose 12.3% uh, to a seasonally adjusted annual rate of 1.364 million units last month. Uh, of course, housing was the big focus of what happened in the run-up to the Great Recession. Right. What are your thoughts on, on right. the way housing has kind of bubbled up a little bit again? Yeah, so this ties in with uh, my book. Yeah. <laughs> For me, it's not surprising, I suppose. <laughs> but uh, housing is uh, driven by narratives. Before 2007, the narrative was flipping houses, houses are, have always gone up, mm -hmm. home prices have always gone up. Then after the Great Recession, it was tragic narratives about people who lost their home uh, and dangers of borrowing too much or lending too much. And now that's been 10, it's been 10 years since the crisis. Yeah. Now those narratives are starting to be forgotten. It's all in this book. It's a, yeah, I know. It's a very good read. So Housing's just a piece of it. We're sneaking back into the old 2007 or 2006 mentality. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, on talking about narrative economics and how these stories go viral and they have an impact on the U.S. economy, would you say that President Trump is really leading a lot of these viral stories? Because when we talk right. about the Fed, President Trump obviously badgering, even putting pressure on Fed Jerome, well, uh, Fed Chair Jerome yeah. Powell, to cut interest rates, and we're seeing that actually hap happen. Market prices is in, and then the Fed actually does cut rates. So is this an example of what you're well, Part of it is that, yeah, Trump is... is talking about the danger, he's kind of critical of the Fed. In fact, I don't know if any president has been, has been uh, less critical. Yeah. And so they, that, that must have some psychological effect on these people. And, you know, they don't want to be seen as having missed it. Uh, the other thing, though, is that Trump uh, models uh, ostentatious living. Uh, I mean, he, he, he's a genius at catching the mood of, of many people. Not everyone. We don't all agree on him. <laughs> but... Uh, yeah, so the people think that they need a fancy house. Now we're back. You know, we're not worried about debt so much anymore. I'm curious, though, when it comes to housing and we're seeing the shift back to where we were maybe pre-2008, yeah. is any of that really due to we're seeing the millennials now getting into a generation where they're buying houses and they're much larger than the generation they're replacing? Does that really go into it all how much more that we're seeing in housing and how does that affect where our economic outlook going forward? Well, the millennials are the same, somewhat the same people who are the student loan uh, uh, people who are uh, uh, complaining a lot. Um, but uh, the bad, bad memories that, you know, millennials don't have memories of earlier crises, uh, not directly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, they graduated into a financial crisis, many of them. Uh, yeah, exactly. When are the millennials? They're people who came of age in, after 2000 or 2000 to 2010. So that's about, uh, yeah, the, the graduating into the financial crisis was not a good idea. There's nothing <laughs> much you can do about it. Yeah. Right. But it creates a, a sore spot in people's thinking. I want to go back to, uh, to when we're discussing President Trump, because in the book you talk about, uh, you know, it's all about the narrative, right? And it's all about kind of the way that these things uh, tend to happen when you're being influenced by whether it's the news or what everyone is talking about. You use the example of, of President Calvin Coolidge to talk uh -huh. about uh, what happened before the Great Depression and the way he focused on the markets and kind of driving the yeah. optimism. Do you see parallels in the way that President Trump yeah. also focuses on the market, steps in whenever the market worries about trade tensions? What are your thoughts on that? 
Now, some of your viewers might not have the clear memory of Calvin Coolidge, <laughs> <laughs> but he's a notable. I think he is the first president to give a talk to the nation as, as a video. And you can find him on YouTube mm -hmm. giving a talk to the nation. <laughs> Uh, so he was like Trump in that he was really business businessman type and pro business, but he was totally opposite Trump in his speaking style. He has the most bland speaking style you can imagine. Yeah. So I recommend you search him out and well, it's watch. It's not a very it. hard sell there, but I mean, is there is there a fear? I think I think Calvin Coolidge did inspire uh, the Roaring Twenties. Yeah. You don't have to be as uh, flamboyant as Trump. But is there to a be problem an in doing that now, the same way that Calvin Coolidge inspired the Roaring Twenties? I, I think so. But unfortunately, Calvin Coolidge is not the example we want yeah. for a good government because it all came crashing down in 1929. Uh, was that his fault? I kind of think it sort of, <laughs> sort of was his fault. But you said it all came crashing down. Is that what we're headed right now? Do you well, think I didn't mean to be so dramatic. Down the uh, pike? Well, we could. I think the stock market is highly priced, as it was in 1929, uh, and not quite as high as 29. Uh, and that's a sign that we're vulnerable to a correction downward. Um, but I don't. I'm, I'm not seeing it as imminent. Mm -hmm. uh, Certainly not in the same way that you saw some other bubbles as imminent before. Well, <laughs> Because you time those ones yeah, very yeah. well. Uh, so yeah, yeah, it's uh, that's why I, 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 this book calls for more research. Indeed, <laughs> but research on people and not just on number crunching. Absolutely, and the way they react to all of the stories out there as well. But it was a very good read, Narrative Economics uh, from Robert Schiller. Robert, thank you so much for taking the time. My pleasure. Appreciate it. Uh, Courtney Nobingas, thank you for taking the hour as well. Thank and Sabio Marcellus, thank you so much. Absolutely. Always for Catch being here on Wednesday. Yeah. Hey investors, Zach Guzman here. Are you interested in learning more about the markets and getting the latest financial news? Well then click right here to subscribe to our Yahoo Finance YouTube channel. Get the latest up-to-the-minute market analysis, big interviews in the world of finance, and information on how to manage your money every day, wherever you are.